Hey everybody, thank you so much for making it to our YouTube channel. I'm super glad that you are here. I hope that today's talk blesses you and it grows your relationship with Jesus. Before we get into the message though, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so that you can be notified every single time that we post. Love you and I'll see you soon at the end of this talk. Signs you need a breakup. Number one, you're the side bay. Side bay never works out. Side bay destroys you, it destroys him or her, and it destroys the children. It destroys the children. And it's interesting that sometimes your parents had a side bay, and now you're becoming the very thing you hated. This to me is a symbol, it's a sign. This to me is a huge arrow pointing to you need healing. And your healing starts with a breakup. Interesting, isn't it? Point number two, here's your second sign. You keep catching them hiding things. If your partner has betrayed your trust too many times, then ending the relationship could be a possibility because it's hard to be happy with being with someone that you cannot trust. Anytime someone is hiding things, that is a red flag, that is a sign that a possible breakup may need to happen because if they had things while you guys are dating, they're going to hide things while you guys are married. If she's hiding things right now that you're dating her representative, let me tell you, she's gonna be hiding things when you guys get married. And the hiding techniques only get better. And the things they hide only get bigger. So that is a sign. Here's the third one. You're learning to accept abuse. When abuse becomes normal, when abuse starts becoming your norm, when you're becoming desensitized to abuse, whether if it's emotional, mental, physical, sexual, financial, you should never settle for any type of emotional abuse. Any type of verbal abuse, you should cut. If they talk to you in a certain disrespectful way and you let it keep happening, it's gonna increase, it's gonna upgrade, it's gonna get worse. And our generation is not having conversations about how to stop people from being verbally abusive to them, from being emotionally abusive to them, from being sexually abusive to them. You gotta cut that. And you tell him, or you tell her, if you don't cut this, I'm gonna cut you. <laughs> so if your iPhone can have seven iOS updates, you better have one on your attitude right now, sir. You better have one right now. Here's the fourth sign that you need a breakup. You're 14. <laughs> All jokes aside, here's number four. You're their last priority. If you are their last priority, that's a sign that you need to break up. You want to know why? If he prefers to hang out with his boys and not spend time with you, you're going to be alone. If she prefers to go out with all her girlfriends and, you know, go party it up and have fun and not spend time with you, you're going to be alone. A lot of fathers are placing, they're placing digits on a computer screen as a priority over their children. <clears throat> Keeping count of that bank account. A lot of mothers are placing everything and everyone else above their children, above their spouses. And this is why the condition of their home is broken. Pay attention. What's his pattern like? What's her pattern like? What grasps him? What grasps her? Are you the last thing that grasps him? Are you the last thing that grasps her? Does she like getting her nails done more than spending time with you? Is her relationship with the credit card deeper than her relationship with you? <laughs> Does she know more about trends and magazines and Kim Kardashian with Kylie Jenner than she knows? Does she even know what your favorite color is? You'd be surprised if you ask a husband, what's your wife's favorite color? Don't know. How old are your kids? Don't know that one either. <laughs> When's your wife's birthday? <laughs> you know why? Because you were their last priority. That's why. So if you're the last priority, that calls maybe for the possibility of a breakup. Number five, you're your lover's parent. Do you need to babysit your boyfriend? Do you need to babysit your girlfriend? Any married person can tell you 
This is so true. A husband that you have to pick up things after. A husband that you have to remind to be responsible. A husband that you have to push to build a home. A husband that you have to push to be a father. A husband that you have to push to be a husband. A husband that you have to push for a date night. A husband that you have to push to go shower. A husband that you have to push to clean up. This is detrimental and some of you are like, that exists? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Your problem is that you're 14. You've never been married. You've, the only people you've lived with are your siblings and your mother or your father or a guardian. But you don't know what it's like to have to take care of a grown adult woman or a grown adult man. It's frustrating. And the reason why we end up with marriages like this is because no one is having these conversations. And that's why this entire series is for me to build a framework for you to consider conversations that no one is having because Netflix stops the conversation at I do and they lived happily ever after. The only good movie on marriage that I've seen is Marriage Story. Because it's real. So we congratulate them because they're telling a real story. It can get that complicated. It does become complicated. And that's why you need to format your mind. This is why we need to think properly. This is why we need to instruct ourselves. This is why it's so important for you to invest some time to come to church to feed your brain, feed your soul, feed your spirit, feed your mind so that you can set yourself up for success in your home, your marriage, your relationship with your children. So we must invest. We must have these spicy conversations now what not to do after a breakup number one don't creep on your ex <laughs> now if you don't know what creep means is stop watching stop stalking stop watching their every move stop stop paying attention to everything they do on instagram i'm so glad the activity log part is out of instagram some of you spent more time being creeps than disciples. <laughs> the biggest mistake people make after a breakup is to focus on what's next for their ex rather than what's possible for them. The truth is you won't have control over what's next for your ex. So why hurt yourself, sweetie? Why hurt yourself, bro? Spending energy, emotions, and time on a headspace that is just going to complicate your next decisions. There is no purpose on you creeping on your ex after a breakup. Number two, don't pretend it doesn't hurt. For some of you, the temptation will be to pretend that you're not affected by the breakup and you're gonna be strong, Miss Independent, it didn't bother me. He just took six years of my life away. I'm fine. <laughs> How many of us know that's total, total, no, totally not true? When you break up, it's okay to feel. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to grieve. Your facade of it doesn't hurt me, it doesn't bother me, and well, life is life and whatever, and you know, it was a chapter, and that was a past, and you know, the story keeps going. No, st stop that. But this whole facade of being strong, and it didn't hurt me, that's stupid. You're human. Of course it hurts. And if it didn't hurt you, why are you in a relationship if you have no feelings? So it's okay, it's okay to feel pain. It's okay to mourn, it's okay to cry, it's okay to grieve, it's okay to vent. It's okay to have time off. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that when you suppress your feelings, when you suppress what you really feel, you're only bottling up emotions that will not come out now, but will come out later. And the worst thing is when you carry and bottle up these emotions into your next relationship, that's a problem. Because the girl or the guy that you end up with, your next partner, they are not at fault for all the garbage that you went through. So you gotta vent out, let it all out. 
let it go. Here's the next one. <clears throat> Do not stay friends, period. <laughs> if there's one advice you can leave with from Crave Church on this topic of breakups, it's this one. This one. Do not stay friends after a breakup. That's like being friends with the people that kidnapped you and released you. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You're kidding yourself. You're playing games. Have you seen DJ Khaled? Congratulations. You played yourself. That's all of you that stay friends with your ex. If you stay friends with your ex because you feel guilty, then all you're doing is leading them on. I feel bad for them. Oh my gosh, how, what, well, what are they going through? I gotta go rescue them. So I'm gonna stay friends just so that it can help him or help her cope. You're leading him or her on. And if it's because you feel like you still have a chance with them, then you're just setting yourself up for more hurt. Whatever your angle is, whether if it's because you want to comfort them in their moment of the breakup or whether if it's because you feel like you have a chance, both of these angles, both of these approaches to staying friends with your ex is going to break you or the other person. Here's number four. Are you ready for number four? Here's what not to do in a breakup. Don't become petty. <laughs> you start doing things to make an outcome happen. You start doing things to affect them in a subtle way. It's subtle. It's subtle. It's not direct. It's indirect. Number five, don't become possessive. After a breakup, you don't have a say in their life anymore. You broke up. You don't have a say in their life anymore. Whether if you are the dumper or the dumpy, <laughs> chuckle, 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 you can't allow your ex to dictate. Watch this. You can't allow your ex to dictate anything in your life because you risk a breakup, get back cycle. When you allow room for your ex after you broke up with him or her, to dictate things and decisions and have a say in your life, you are risking a get back, break up, get back, break up, get back, break up cycle. And a get back, break up cycle is poisonous. It's hurtful, it's painful, it's complicated, it's mixed up, it's messy. So when you break up, you break up. Protect your ground, stand your ground, stay consistent with your decision. And, 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 and when you break up, your temptation is going to be like, but, 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 but what is he going to think? What is she going to think? It doesn't matter, sweetie. Amen. Yep. Doesn't matter, bro. You broke up, you're a free man. You broke up, you're a free woman. Do whatever the hell pleases you under God's will. Now, here's, 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 here's one of my favorite ones. When you break up, here's what not to do. Don't confuse love with familiarity. And I'm going to read this one. Oh, no, I deleted it because I was going to speak freely. Listen to this. When you break up, you're going to go through withdrawals because you're used to this person. You had a routine with them. You had them by your side. Things weren't working out. Things were not healthy. Things weren't going anywhere. He was not a godly person. She was not a godly person. He wasn't growing you. She wasn't growing you. He wasn't leading you closer to God. She wasn't leading you closer to God. They were leading you further away from God. He had dumb habits. She had stupid ones. <clears throat> and you fought more than you loved. Have you met couples that they start so well and all they are is lovey-dovey in the beginning and then all they do at the end is fight? That's because they confused love with chemistry. Chemistry is not love. 
But since we're in the topic of a breakup, I want to tell you that familiarity is not love either. Because when you break up with someone that is not good for you, you're going to miss them. And the feeling of missing a person is confused with loving the person. Remember, they took a chunk of your life. They were with you. You have more free time. You're more alone now. Of course you're going to miss the routine. Of course you're going to miss their voice. Of course, you might even be like dumb romantic. I even miss the fights. Oh, <laughs> spare me. I don't know if I want to laugh or vomit when I hear things like that. <laughs> and what tends to, <laughs> what tends to happen, <laughs> what tends to happen is you go, I miss them so much. And it's because I love them so much. No. No, you possibly don't love them. And this is where people get back. And then the fights begin. The problems that led you to a breakup resurfaced after three minutes. <laughs> three hours. I'm just kidding, three weeks. And then you break up again. And then guess what? You miss them again. And you get back. And then you break up because the same issues that were there, which is that they have not become and you have not become, you have not grown, you have not matured. That's the issue. And there's no love in that. Because if you don't love yourself and you can't become who you are, how the heck are you going to supposed to love somebody? You know, some of you have a hard time loving yourself. If you can't love yourself, how do you expect to love somebody else, dude? Come on. So don't confuse love with routine, with familiarity. I'm accustomed to him. I'm accustomed to her. It's going to hurt for a while, but remain in your decision because you broke up for a reason. Here's number seven. Don't play the awkward card. Things not to do after a breakup. Don't play the awkward card. Be civil. You broke up, yes. But it doesn't mean you need to dramatize the scene every time you're in proximity at the event, function, or at church. Just remain civil. Say it with me. Just remain civil. Again, just remain civil. Remain respectful. Remain neutral. It's only as awkward as you make it. Do I have to leave the church? You don't have to leave the church if your ex comes to the same church. If he sits here, sit over there. <laughs> Plus, you came to focus on one man, Jesus, not him. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Number eight, don't kiss and tell. When you break up with your ex, and if it was a bad breakup, your temptation is going to be to vent all their flaws and weaknesses. You want to be... You want to be a representative of the kingdom of heaven, which is to extend what people do not deserve. Grace. We would have so much less drama in our life if we didn't kiss and tell after a breakup. And here's the ninth one. Are you ready for this one? <laughs> I saved this one for last because it was great. Say spicy on three. One, two, three. Spicy. Oof, yes. Oof. This one's spicy. What not to do after a breakup? Number nine. <laughs> Don't become the friend with benefits. <laughs> Sexual benefits. I mean, if you want to get your Instagram story, get this one, okay? Sexual benefits without commitment is huge after a breakup, but this damages both sides. This develops a pattern of, I can pick you up whenever I want in one person, and it can leave the other person emotionally void and used. You're so comfortable with him. You're so comfortable with her. You broke up and you stayed friends. And so now he's dropping off at home because no one in the entire church had a car.
Only he had a car. You didn't feel safe with the kind greeters or your best friend because you only feel safe with him or her. <clears throat> and you have to tell him something. Hey, I gotta talk to you, I have to tell you something. Do you mind? Have you heard that one? Have you heard that one? But just give me five minutes. I just wanna talk to you for five minutes. Those five minutes turns into a car ride where you park outside the house and you become the friends with benefits. That's what those five minutes become. Can someone say spicy? Spicy. And because you're comfortable with the person, and all he's thinking is with... If you're 14 and above, you probably understood that. He's thinking not with his head. He pulls a move on you. And because you miss him, because you miss her, and he is your weakness, and she is your weakness, you give all access without commitment. Dangerous. All right, here's my third point tonight. How to handle a breakup. And I want to actually let you know that tonight isn't just about a romantic heartbreak. Tonight is for any type of heartbreak. Maybe your dream job was given to someone else, and that someone else is living your dream. Maybe your mom or your dad, they broke your heart. Maybe your second marriage is starting to feel like your first marriage, if you've ever been married. Maybe you're stressed out because you, are, you haven't even had a first marriage and you're going, how come they get a second one? I don't even have a first one. And I could possibly be heartbroken today because I'm 30 without a girlfriend. But if you have the right perspective, you can navigate through a heartbreak. It doesn't matter what type of heartbreak. And you can persevere and be triumphant on the other side. And see, the truth is this, that I've seen what many of you have seen. I've seen people despair, fear, and they've allowed fear to dictate their decisions. I've seen people resist. I've seen people push back in a moment where they are experiencing a heartbreak. And in the midst of this heartbreak, in the midst of realizing that it isn't going to happen for you, in the midst of feeling like God isn't answering their prayers or your prayers, you lose faith. A lot of you have gone through a heartbreak and you circle around this one question. And those of you who haven't experienced a heartbreak, one day you will be tempted to ask yourself this one question. And this question is what sets the course to the perspective that you are inclined to take whenever pain faces your life. This question is the question that has made many people walk away from their faith in God. This question without the proper perspective has the power to get you to walk away from God. Do you want to know what the question is? This is the one question that we are all tempted to ask and circle and circle and circle around every single time pain faces your life. Every single time a heartbreak happens. Every single time the dream did not happen. Every single time he or she said no. Every single time that you experienced something that you were not wanting to. Every time that you experience frustration and pain and you feel like God did not answer your prayer and you feel like God has let you down. Here's the one question that has the power to get you to walk away from God and your faith if you don't have the right perspective. You ready for the question? The question is this. How could a loving God do this to me? In this moment of pain, in this moment where you're wondering if God is for you and the Bible says who could be against me, then why is this thing against me? That even though, you gotta understand this, even though God is present in your pain, I challenge you to wrestle with this thought that God didn't author your pain. Jesus taught us something. Jesus spoke some words, as a matter of fact. He said, when you follow me, you gotta understand something. When you choose to hear what I'm saying to you, when you choose to pay attention to my words, you will notice something, that Jesus spoke this in John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in 
Me. Not Marla, God. I've told you this, all these things. Because I need you to understand that you have peace. You can find peace in me. Why? Because here on earth, you will have many Read it a little louder. You will have many trials and sorrows. Wow. But take heart. Take heart. Because I have overcome the world. You are safe in my hands. Even though it seems like there is no way out, I am your way maker. Even though you don't have peace, if you let me in, I am your prince of peace. If you don't have strength, I am your strength. If you need wisdom to navigate your decisions, I am wisdom. I am comfort. I am strength. I am peace. Now watch this. It's interesting that the people that we look up to the most, the people that we admire the most are those that in spite of their pain, in spite of their heartbreak, in spite of their future looking lost, their faith for a brighter future remained. These are the people that we call our heroes. Why do we look up to Martin King Luther Jr.? Why do we look up to all the legends and heroes that we look up to. It's because during their trial, during their pain, during their sorrow, during their heartbreak, they persevered. We're captured by our heroes because they persevered throughout the odds. They persevered through the pain. They persevered through the heartbreak, they persevered when everything seemed lost. They persevered when nothing was working out. They persevered when they were at a dead end. They persevered when there were no more options. And you're going, my goodness, I admire that. It's their confidence to rise. It's their confidence to rise in opposition that captures our hearts. And this is why we admire and look up to them. And their secret, what's their secret? Their secret is found in their perspective. Say it with me on three, perspective. One, two, three. Perspective. That somehow, some way, they remained open and available to the possibility of what God had for them, even if what God had for them did not align to their plan. They refused cynicism and bitterness, which is a temptation we all face, because part of our problem is this, that there's a little prosperity gospel in all of us. And the prosperity gospel says, give God one and he'll give you 10. It's pretty much saying, since I did, then God must. And some of us grew up with that version of the gospel. Some of us grew up with that type of mentality. But what we should know, what you should know is that that is not the original version. Jesus did not offer us an equation. Jesus did not, uh, he did not offer, Jesus did not die on a cross to offer us a one, two, three step. Ta-da, you get what you want. Jesus did not die on a cross. Jesus, what he offered us was an invitation and his invitation was this, follow me. And follow me not because what I could do for you, but instead follow me because of who I am and what I've already done for you and David 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 learned this lesson the hard way and you all know the story but in case you don't I want to summarize the story David grew up as a shepherd boy humble little 15 17 year old kid tending sheep in the field and then one day God tells the prophet of Israel go and anoint Jesse's son which was David Anoint him because he's going to be the next king. He's going to replace the evil king or the dumb king, King Saul, that is in kingship right now. And so Samuel goes and he anoints King David. He anoints him as the next king. But because there is a present king, it displayed a problem. So then David goes back to tending sheep, even though he was anointed to be the next king. One day as he's tending sheep, as the anointed king, serving where you are faithfully, that's an amazing lesson, but we're not going to get into that. 
His dad calls him and says, hey, I need you to take a pizza, some bread, and some cheese to your brothers who are in a battlefield right now because there's this dude called Goliath who's threatening the nation of Israel. David goes and he goes into the battlefield, delivers the pizza to his brothers, and then he hears this giant called Goliath taunting the people of Israel, and he says, this guy's not just threatening us, he's threatening the name of the living God. Hell no. And he steps into the field and to cut the story short, he ends up slaying this giant. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts going, my goodness, he becomes a living legend from morning to night, from night to morning, instantly he becomes a living legend. Right after this, he gets invited into the king's palace. He gets invited to marry the king's daughter. He married into the royal family. But then one day, one day King Saul posted a picture on Instagram and he got a thousand likes and then a few minutes after that King David posted another picture and he got 10,000 likes and they were singing David got 10,000 all the girls in the choir at church start singing David got 10,000 likes Saul only got a thousand and guess what King Saul became jealous and envious of David to the point where he wanted to kill King David David now is an anointed king his life is made his life is just set he married into the royal family he's got the money he's got the palace and now he becomes a fugitive on the run for his life and he's running for his life and he runs into the wilderness and suddenly his future goes dark heartbreak 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 he ends up alone he ends up scared and he panics and then he runs into the small little village filled with a lot of priests. There were a lot of priests and their wives were there. And this little village had a priest called Ahimelech. And Ahimelech was David's friend. And David goes to Ahimelech the priest and he lies to him in a moment of panic. He lies to him in a moment of despair. He lies to him in a moment of heartbreak. And the text puts it this way in 1 Samuel 21 verse 8-9. David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear or a sword? The king's business was so urgent that I didn't even have time to grab a weapon. So Ahimelech's like, what? You're doing the king's business? Where are the men? Where are your bodyguards? If you're doing the king's business, you should have bodyguards, you should have weapons, and you should have some food. And then David lost him and says, I was such in a hurry because this urgent matter was so urgent that I didn't have time to get a spear and I didn't have time to grab a weapon or some food. Do you have some food and a weapon? And David lied in a moment of panic, in a moment of fear, in a moment of desperation, of a heartbreak, just like so many of us lie when we're trying to make or force our outcome. And the next thing that happens is so dramatic and so special the next thing that happens is just such a powerful little moment. This is what the text says. Ahimelech said, I only have the sword of Goliath, you know, the guy that you killed, whom you killed in the valley of Allah. Ahimelech literally brings out a visual aid, a visual reminder of God's faithfulness to David in the past. A reminder that God had made a promise. A reminder to trust even when life didn't make sense. But David is in a dark moment where he feels hopeless. And he decides to literally take hands, take matters into his own hands. And he says, there is nothing like it, David replied. Give it to me. And instead of this sword protecting a life, this sword sealed Ahimelech's fate. Because later on, someone reports to King Saul that Ahimelech handed a weapon to King David. And so King Saul, in an angry moment, travels with a small army to this little village where Ahimelech and all these priests lived. And he confronts Ahimelech and says, how dare you help the king's enemy? And Ahimelech's like, what are you talking about? I didn't help the king's enemy. Of course I'm supposed to help him. He buried your daughter. He's part of the palace. Why wouldn't I help your friend? Why wouldn't I help your son-in-law? And in his rage, King Saul murders 
Ahimelech, but because he was so jealous, because he was so envious, he murders his wife, he murders all the priests, all their wives, and he murders their children. David then gets word. And David's heartbreak just got more complex. Because he knows that in the moment of heartbreak, he took matters into his own hands. He lied. And this entire painful consequence that affected others around him was his fault. Powerful lesson. Time passes by, and now David is in his 60s, and he is the king. And he faces a very eerily similar situation. King David's favorite son called Absalom. What's his name? Absalom. King David's favorite son gets angry at King David because King David was a passive father to respond to the rape of Absalom's sister, which was King David's daughter. And so Absalom the favorite son of King David gets angry and he plans a revolt against David. For four years, he planned his revolt. He raised his own army, won the hearts of the people of Israel, which was the nation that King David was reigning, and he divided Israel. And one day, one day, Absalom announces himself as king and marches on the capital city to take his own father's throne. He takes his own father's throne. And in order to avoid bloodshed, in order to avoid war, in order to avoid, to avoid a civil war, King David packs up his things and he packs up the people that he loves the most that are closest to him. And he flees into the wilderness. And he runs away again. Once again, the future is dark. But now he's in his 60s. Now he's learned a little bit of how to handle a heartbreak. Second Samuel tells us the whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on toward, watch this, the wilderness. The heartbreak repeated. And so here's the question. Have you ever felt like this was your life. Heartbreak after heartbreak. Everything you leaned on is now gone. And now you're headed back towards the same wilderness all over again. Have you ever felt this way? That the things that you had conquered, the things that you had overcome, the things that were troubling you, the things that were breaking your heart are now the things that are repeating themselves again. You experienced a wilderness and all of a sudden you're experiencing this wilderness all over again. You've been there. You've been here. It hurts. It's a heartbreak. It's tough. The future is dark. But in the story, there was a twist. Verse 24 says this, Zadok was there too. Zadok was an advisor for King David. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying, can you say this with me, the Ark of the Covenant of God. So on the way out of the city, when David's packing up his stuff and he's taking his entourage out, Zadok decides to offer an idea and he says, let's take the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, what was the Ark of the Covenant of God? The Ark of the Covenant of God was where God's presence would live. It represented the presence of God. So in other words, whoever had the Ark of the Covenant of God had God on their side. This Ark of the Covenant of God was a symbol. Say a symbol. It was a symbol of status to subtly manipulate an outcome. But David had learned his Lesson, and he was done with trying to control and manipulate outcomes. He was done playing games. The Ark of the Covenant was Zadok trying to tell Absalom, God is with us. So if you don't back up, you're going to be obliterated. And King David caught that. You know how sometimes people post certain things on Instagram trying to manipulate an outcome? 
trying to make themselves look better than what they really are, trying to make themselves look like they have it all together, trying to make it to get acceptance, maybe? Have you ever seen people post certain things to get a promotion or to get noticed and you forgot that God is your promoter? King David had gone through this before. King David realized, I am not going to manipulate an outcome this time. I've learned my lesson twice. Because you got to remember that the first time he learned it was when he was running away and Ahimelech gets killed. And the second time was when he messed up with a woman called Bathsheba while she was taking a bath. Don't trust the Bathsheba in the bath. <laughs> and he gets this girl pregnant. and She becomes his hide bay. But she had a husband. And he tries to manipulate the outcome by getting her husband killed. As a result of that decision to manipulate an outcome, a huge consequence came over him and his entire family to the point where Absalom's actions were a reflection and a consequence of his manipulating the outcome with Bathsheba. He learned this lesson twice that caused him a lot of pain. You should read the story. It's interesting. And this time he says, I'm done playing with games. In verse 25, says, Then the king said to Zadok, Take the Ark of the Covenant back into my city. Zadok says, What? Why would we take it back? Don't you know that this is... No, no, take it back. I'm done manipulating. No more manipulation. No more negotiation. No more trying to get... God to do what I want, what I desire, what I'm feeling. I'm dying to my will. I'm if the breakup happened, I'm okay with that because I trust God. If my heartbreak is trying to dictate my next situations, my next decisions, I'm not going to allow that. No more manipulation. No more negotiations. No more equations. And what King David says next is for you. It's for me. It's for all of us. He says, if I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. He had stopped all manipulation. He had stopped trying to control. Like some of you need to stop trying to control the outcome. He has stopped and he had surrendered. And listen to what he says next. Verse 26. But if he says, if God says, David, I'm not pleased with you. Then I am ready. I accept it. I trust him. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. In other words, David was saying, I'm resting in his hands. I know that he's got my world in the palm of his hands. I know that. The outcome is in my father's hands. This is an obstacle to my plan, but it's not an obstacle to God's plan. That's the perspective. That's the perspective in a heartbreak. That's the perspective. And watch this. Verse 30 says this. David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was... Say it a little bit louder like you mean it. His head was... And he was... David had lost his son... David had lost his dignity. David had lost his kingdom. But somehow, some way, he had not lost his confidence in God. He didn't abandon God when it appeared that God had abandoned him. This time, he didn't try taking matters into his own hands. This time, he didn't anchor his faith to the fulfillment of his dreams or his desires. Because when you set the anchor, your faith on the fulfillment of your dreams, you set yourself up to lose your confidence and faith in God and you will walk away from God. So here's my conclusion. In this moment of frustration in your heartbreak, would you be willing to partner up with people like King David to open up your hands? And say, God, here are my plans, here are my dreams, here are my ambitions, here are my goals. Do to me whatever seems good to you. Would you be willing to have a posture of trust in your heart that says, God, even if I don't understand why this has happened to me, I do understand one thing, that you are a good God and I can trust you. 
I can trust you. No manipulation, no negotiation, no equations. Because even if your dreams can't come true, it doesn't mean that God can't have a significant purpose for you. In your moments of heartbreak, in the moments where you don't understand why, in the moments that are difficult, where you find it unfair, we choose to run in these moments. But what I would say is this, would you choose to run to lean in? Would you choose to run to look up at God? Would you choose to run and reach out to the God who actually holds your entire life in your hands, who loves you, who has great plans for you, who will never fail? Would you choose to run? Hey, thank you so much for listening. I hope that blessed you. And if you would ever want to partner financially with us, you can do so by going to www.cravechurch.org or the link will be in the description box. Share the message, spread the love, and I'll see you again next time.